Give me a little bit of my but I'm I'm uh, using my speaker notes here. Uh, when when I asked for you if we could have a talk, you said yes, and she said it'd be good if it had a good name. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I came up with with this name. Uh, and I like to play with words. Um, this. This image is from uh, 2014. It's a composite of video um, stills from when uh, very one of the very first times I ever decided to make um, to turn uh, these this collection of magazines that I'll talk about in a little bit into paper pulp. And uh, one of the things that I hope to talk about later is the is this kind of documentary impulse to kind of like. You can call it diaristic or whatever. But it's, it's, I, I'm always torn when I'm making stuff between the impulse to want to do the thing, but also to want to watch the thing happen. So I'm always recording things, and it slows everything down immensely because I'm making often making the video at the same time that I'm making the other thing. It's hard to know which other one is going to be the product. Um. This is just a funny piece. This piece is called Taking of Its Head. Um, and uh, it's uh, funny because it's uh, this is the first time, this is about 2014, 15. Uh, it's the first time I realized that I can just get it to stick to the wall without trying very hard um, and um, or at all. And uh, I don't know, I think the idea of using a when you're drawing yin yang symbol or something as a Kind of a carnival target game is funny, also because my aim is is so bad. But that's why it's also called statement of intent. Um, uh, I don't know. Just intentions, right? We the best laid like, intentions, right? We we can sometimes uh, miss miss the mark. And I once heard heard in a sermon that the the word uh, sin is translated from the Hebrew from a Hebrew uh, word and Greek word that is, that means um, to miss the mark. So. Mm -hmm. um, just some works that have been important for me over the last uh, few years. I'll talk about some other ones too. Um, uh, Vessel has been canceled, but he's still the book is still important to me. Um, apparently, like <laughs> apparently he's an asshole. Like <laughs> um, uh, three to four moments by Kathy Blue. She's she covers uh, she she writes about she's an actor who writes about the white power movement and um, and this book in particular is about the mapping of the lost cause narrative from the civil rights era and the post-civil rights era onto the Vietnam War, right? So you go from one war that the South lost when they invented this myth, this kind of absolving myth around it to try and uh, make it about you know states' rights or whatever or honor. Um, and then that became something that the white power movement used really effectively in their recruiting um, after Vietnam. Um, learning from the Germans, I'd be really interested to talk to Susan Miner about that now because she, she was, and she's talking about the parallels between the Holocaust and um, and uh, slavery and memories of those two things, and, and respectively, Germany and the U.S. Um, how the efforts that Susan Miner has made that, to, that, the, that the Germans have made to remember the Holocaust um, and uh, with and then respectively, the kind of like nascent efforts in the U.S. And if anybody doesn't know, the body keeps the score. Uh, at this point, it's a you know it's a book about how uh, people with with like severe trauma can um, find ways to uh, feel uh, alive in the present. Um. I was the word first and talk about the book. Um, so this is a, from a series of a lot of time. I'm kind of going back to to to, to early 2007. Eight, I was living in New Orleans, where Emily's from, uh, and 
I was working at a bookstore in the French Quarter. Um, and I was reading a lot because I worked in a bookstore and I read a lot of uh, James Baldwin when I was, that was a big introduction for me there. I was also at that time um, going to, uh, I, I learned about these lectures that Paul Chan was giving. He's an artist uh, in, uh, he was giving them at Tulane and Xavier University. No, at UNO and Xavier University for free, and they were open at eight. That was why the condition that he would teach is that Neil could come for free. And um, one of them was a contemporary art history um, uh, seminar. Uh, and that was really awesome because it was the first time I've ever actually been able to talk about contemporary art. Um, and then he was also putting on waiting for Bodeau, which was this kind of like massive community project that involved a lot of. Local stakeholders and creative time in New York. And um, uh, so it was something when I graduated from undergrad at Gilbert, I kind of had this drawing degree that I didn't really know what to do with. And so that was a time in which art kind of came back to life for me. Um, uh, this quote is, a, is about Norman Mailer, the writer turned politician, Norman Mailer. Um, and it's from James Baldwin. Uh, he's writing about how disappointed he was. When Norman Mailer decided to go into politics, because Norman Mailer had been a white writer who was writing, who wrote about um, race and culture. Uh, and it wasn't the things he wrote about that, from Baldwin's perspective, were not particularly good, but he was a really talented writer. And Baldwin really thought he had an um, obligation to pursue that. Um, so, however, um, I don't know, um, messianic or whatever it might seem. And I did really identify with this strong kind of uh, this kind of like job description of the artist, um, uh, which he describes here is you're one of the very few writers who now might really become a great writer who might help excavate the very con the very consciousness of this country, and you want to settle for being the lousy mayor of New York. Anything I want to say one thing. One more thing about this. So, so one of the instant <laughs> problems. So when I so I was like I was like how do you we had, I had seen Kara Walker's work before before the Paul Chan seminars. I was I was familiar with work, but I but you know any of you who know Kara Walker's work know that you don't often have conversations about Kara Walker's work. And so there was a there was one night we had this really good discussion about it and. Um, and and I was just like, I what if I started cutting up these uh, pictorial histories of the Confederacy that I had? Um, but then a problem emerges. There are a few problems that emerge when you're thinking about trying to depict white supremacy. Which is like, one is that like you uh, that I want to talk about is that how do you depict it in 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 white people's complicity with it um, without using just like Clan hoods, right? Which are a kind of like by now uh, a trope of visual arts. Like when you want to talk about racism, you use a clan hood. Um, and I'm not saying that's good or bad, but I did just call it a trope. So um, this is from the same series. I'm sorry, this image is so bad. It's from 2007. Didn't know how to take pictures. Um, uh, These are all small. They're about, you know, the max dimensions on these is about nine inches. So these these uh, pieces of paper are from a book uh, that will become more important later called "In Battle of the It's a history of uh, uh, history of Southerners at War. It's by a historian named uh, Bell Irvin Wiley. And um, uh, another image, another problem that comes up when you think about trying to describe white supremacy in images is how do you use how do you describe it without using images of the suffering and forced education of black people or enslaved people? So um, that's something that I kind of had to work out as well. Because um, on one hand, there's like the postmodern idea that like your your picture, a picture is a picture is not a person, right? If you cut a picture, you're not hurting a person, right? Uh, pictures that are they're effectively awfulless now. They can be they can be reproduced infinitely. Blah 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 blah. blah. Um, 
but uh, but at the same time, if I believe that cutting up a picture of a Confederate flag has power, then I have to believe that that the ways I use pictures in other ways um, also have power. So it, it became kind of uh, yeah, kind of important to me. Um, although I've never really named it as such to, to kind of to try and describe this without using images that I don't that I can't claim. Uh, that's Jefferson Davis's wife's dress. That's the kind of like cloud shape or flower shape, whatever this is back on there's upturned. And I was definitely thinking about Katrina in this situation because you know there was all these um, people who had to like escape through their attics. Um, um, and then the so so you, you can't use pictures of can't. And I want to use pictures of, of like the Klan or like recognizable races because I want to talk about something that's more pervasive and universal than that. And I don't want to use pictures of that are that are rearming people or doing more injury in the present, um, uh, or that I don't have a specific kind of a relationship to. Um, so then the question is like, how do you create an image about something as opaque and hollow as white supremacy without? Without making a hollow image, okay. Without making an image that can just be um, reduced to being meaningless. Right? If you guys have any questions, please please ask me. Again, these are small. Can you tell me more about that image? What that does mean to you? Yeah, so it's to me like so these are logs from like a some like uh camp that was a semi-temporary camp that was built on some battlefield or something like that. So I'm like cut a house apart and build this little tree um that's kind of a burning trash can, right? Um and the flag right there, right, is this wooden flag. So there's this kind of like sense of like dryness and rigidity to it. Um, and then there's little stars that are cut in the other flag that are kind of around. So it's supposed to be something that feels like that, that references nationalism, right? That references patriotism, but at the same time, it seems very, very fragile, very brittle, very, um, 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 inflexible, right? And also, and also self-destructive. Right? Uh, around that time, I also started working at a um, pre K through eighth grade Episcopal school in New Orleans and the called St. Andrews. And the, the chaplain there would often kind of like help me through my daily like psychotic crises of teaching. Um, <laughs> uh, and in DDS, she was also like involved in white anti racism within, the, within that uh, diocese at the time. And she uh, she told me one day that the the the, the, germ, the word threat derives from the German pressing, which means to devour. So when one threats, one is devouring oneself. Which is what anxiety feels like. Well, that's kind of like subtext to to this when you when when you see, uh, especially in the next few slides, you start talking about the machines that I'm using the or the, the blender over there. Like the sound of a blender or the sound of the journalism that's implied in the next few images had been something that's actually really helpful and grounding for me um, when I'm working because it's just like loud and kind of fast. But it does, it is the like power, it references the, the, the motor of anxiety, right? That, that one can feel it, as Bethel would say, one's Vegas nerve, right? When you're So this is jumping forward a few years, this is graduate school. And that's the same book. So I brought the book with me because I was like, oh, there's lots of art in here. Um, just have to get it out. Um, and um, I didn't intend to drill it up like this. I was trying to use it as a face and a sculpture, but then I just liked how much it, it was it felt when I was drilling it. Um, And again, there's this, this is when the like that, that, that documentary diagnostic kind of like I need to record this as I do it impulse starts. 
Um, uh, the first video was recorded by me, and this video was recorded by my grad classmate, uh, Vlad Smolkins. Now it runs a gallery in Baltimore. That's what? Um, uh, it's called CPM if you're ever there, and it's, it's based in a house, but it's like he does good stuff. Um, and as I said, I think at the very beginning, yeah, uh, not because I thought it was really important to remember, but because, because I could decide about like watching it happen more or, or doing it more, right? Um, Collage is really slow. I made a video of me collaging that would be like that would be excruciating for anyone to watch, and I never had that had that impulse. But this is so fast that I felt like if I didn't record it, I might be something, right? Of course, so there's a process that feels like kind of cathartic, but then you're like, well, how does this become something that someone else can see as art? Um, um, <laughs> how do you make a living off of that? You know, um, <laughs> there's one way to think about that, you know, but also how do you share it with other people? You know, um, one of the um, tensions that I also kind of dealt with is like, how do you show, how do you show time as still medium, right? Whether it's 2D or 3D, like how do you show time passing? Um, how do you show a before and an after? I'll talk about that and after later. So these are just kind of pictures of what was what it looked like after drilling it up so this is this is one of the actors this is this is uh the book the kind of the carcass of the book kind of bound up with the tape this piece is called an illustrated history of southerners at war this is also grad school so again there's this kind of formal element to it uh she was asking about that to talk more about other piece the, the, the flag piece right it's kind of like has these like nods to a formal uh, symbol like a flag, right? And this has a nod to a formal symbol like like funereal flowers, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it also kind of like engages the kind of like whole idea of like the southern gothic like decay, something that is like beautiful because of how it's falling apart. Right? Um, um, one of the Greatest like compliments I ever received was to Roger White, who's a painter, uh, who's a visiting artist when I was at ACU one time, came and said this is like a size formerly sculpture, and he's like a famous, very famous painter. Uh, um, kind of critically, like people were like on the fence about him, um, uh, but he's from Lexington, Virginia, and um, uh, so I, I really appreciated that because it felt like there was like a resonance there. Okay. Um, so what happened was I ended up taking pictures of the of the of the pieces of paper and blowing up really large to make these large prints that were 32 by 40. Um, and uh, this was made, I actually hired a, an undergraduate photographer who had an additional passive lens, which is a very fancy camera with a with a macro lens, which is a lens that lets you take pictures of things super crisp and detailed. Um, because to me, it's as much about the edges and things like that as it was about anything else. How, what's the size of that object? The object is 32 by 40, so it's about the size of that projection, the black box that you see in there. What's the size of the, the oh, the, 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 the piece of paper? Yeah. So if you can take something really small and blow it up with something really big, you know, and kind of make a big deal out of something that's just like this little, you know, fiction that you kind of stumbled into. Mm -hmm. But this is what, like, what I saw was like what I saw when I was like, oh, there's a bunch of ghosts in here. It's just like kind of like two, um, yeah, yeah, totally. Well, the clan, I mean, the white hood, right, is like, is like a ghost, right? Um, uh, so this is called, this piece is called Nothing Scarier Than Stupid Ghosts. Um, um but yeah, so. Oh, this one is called Righteous Wound, which which a, a, a guy who's getting a, a, a divinity degree told me was like the one of the theological terms for Christ's wounds. So again, this the, I that's Robert E. Lee, by the way. And it wasn't like I was like, let me drill up Robert E. Lee, but it's like if you drill a book about Confederacy, you're gonna have some famous people to it's a lot of, you know. Um, <laughs> So, 
And of course, yeah, the fact that he's had this, the fact that he has these like wings like in his core that look like an aging like face, right? And and like even like that, like his props is like blasted, right? It's like there's those are things that I haven't like talked about really explicitly before, but but I, I mean it would be dishonest to say that, that was important in you know, like, but you have the contrast of his formal address and this kind of way. Okay, so I'm gonna change direction here to talk about home. <clears throat> um, this is my parents' house. Um, that's my mom right there. I didn't even know she was in the picture. <laughs> that's why I put it up. Okay, um, because you can't see anything in her house because of everything. Um, uh, homesick, the word nostalgia actually means homesick. Um, yeah, in my childhood home, pragmatism and beauty are equally treasured, right? And beauty is not privileged, it is treasured, but it is not privileged. So you have things like at the entry to the house, there's just like a ton of shoes, you know, but also some like really worthless trophies, but also a bottle that's probably worth a couple hundred dollars to my dad, probably dug out of a dump in the behind our house, you know, but also some luggage that who knows when the last time that was used. I talked about this a little bit at the opening, just about the, the idea of like objects being rendered useless or dysfunctional by their content, right? So here's like a dresser that you can't even see because of all the pictures that are just pouring, pouring out of it. Um, everything is very interesting. Everything has a narrative, right? Uh, but you, you, you often cannot see the trees for the horse. Okay. Um, in the body of the score, Bessel van der Kolk talks about um, veterans who kind of like are afraid of therapy because they're worried about getting better because they're worried that getting better means forgetting, right? Um, they feel they and one of the one of the quotes that is that he attributes to one of the veterans' history is that they must become living in war to their friends who died and to their experiences in war. Um, in many ways, this is not unrelated to the ethic of retaining objects that my parents have. have. Uh, the home is a living memorial to the stories of homes, but also to the Ur story, the meta story, that through intention, a minority of good people can redeem the glut and greed of the majority. Right? We can keep all of this and we will make use for everything. Not a problem with capitalism, right? It's not a problem with just being human, right? We can save all of it. And all of that is like an avoidance of grief. Just look at that. Look at the cushion underneath. It looks like cherry. It looks like cherry from Pee Wee Herman. Yeah. Okay. Like, why does cherry have an extra? Are they trying to shut cherry up? <laughs> like, is that cushion there to make the chair more comfortable, or is it there because because mom just can't? Like, it does not fit just right. Okay. <laughs> Maybe yeah, <laughs> but like she she just like can't bear. Like sentencing an object to place by getting rid of it. And this is something that's, I mean, I think if, if any of us have like aging grandparents or aging parents, like this is something that that, that you're thinking. Um, um I, I think about this a lot with regard to my own impulses within my work. Why am I repurposing these objects? Am I trying to redeem them? Am I avoiding a grief? Am I trying to absolve them of their places by turning them into art? What do I expect my children to do with it? Also, that's a self portion I did when I was 17. Didn't know if you want to um, This was for Misha, who's not here. Tell her you saw it. Okay. 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 <laughs> um, this is a Caravaggio painting of uh, Doubting Thomas healing Christ's wound. Um, that, that, that idea of trying to like 
of like going to the the painful place, right? Or like of like of like trying to figure out what it's like if it's real or not, you know, is something that I feel like resonant is resonant is resonant with me. He's often, you know, treated, I think maltreated within within uh, Christianity for, for showing someone who lacks faith. But in many ways, I think he has a lot of faith because he's like he really wants to know. So this is um across the street from basically across the street from my house where I grew up. It's the site of the Stokes County Courthouse, which is in the background on the right there. Um, this is a, a memorial to Confederate soldiers in Stokes County, from Stokes County, which is a very rural northwestern North Carolina um, uh, place. Uh, hopefully, I'll remember to talk about that more in a second. Um, uh, this was dedicated in 1990. I went to the dedication. My parents are musicians, and they had horns that they had found in the in the town. Because we lived there in like one of the buildings in town, they got all this brass, these brass horns that I had restored for the dedication. So a great amount of energy went into dedicating this monument that's supposed to be like a it's this is supposed to indicate that you can have heritage without hate, right? The whole prop, the whole project of this is done by the historical society and the Science of Confederate Veterans to say, say we can we can pay tribute to Confederate ancestors uh, in an honorable way or something like that, which is something that became really important. Um, so this is me at the grave of my great, great, great grandfather. We all have thousands of ancestors, right? I'm attached to this one because we, my parents' name, my middle name, everything. And then they took me on my 10th birthday to take a picture of that his great site. So it made me feel like that was important, right? But, uh, and I definitely knew that that was the mess up symbol, but I also knew that that's what I was from, right? And so that, that sense of being conflicted at your origin, right? Is, is it's not just important to my work, but I think it's like it is what I'm from, right? Of being at least if you're white, right? Being on the wrong side of history, right? Um, if you look here, Company H, Twin Second Regiment, you can see on the line of the tree. That's what that center of stone memorializes mm -hmm. to. So this is the Stokes County Courthouse. There's a sorry. Yeah. Did that mean that your ancestor was from Stokes County? And also this, yes. Oh yeah. Okay. But I had other answers. John Nicholson, while they were found in Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, was was apparently. I mean, this is where the lore comes in. Like I found this thing, and I was like, oh, he was he was in this this regiment. It was also from Stokes County, and, and I told my dad that. And he told my grandfather, and he was like, oh, he went off to war, and he never came back, and nobody ever knew what happened to him. You know, that's supposed to be funny. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I would tell that funny. But it's just like I mean, the romanticization, right? It's just like, oh, he was lost, he was disappeared, and now you've re you've re recovered him, that you know, kind of thing. Like, uh, it's it's tricky. Um, Danbury is a little hamlet of a hundred people, um, but it used to be a county seat, which is why we have this giant old old house there. Uh, in 1997, a uh, clan from a neighboring county, from Surrey County, came and had a rally in Danbury at the courthouse. Uh, I that, I did not take this picture. I think my dad took this picture. I, I was in my bedroom, which is again like a block away. So I was just like listening to them on the loudspeaker in my bedroom, just like freaking out about how scary that was. Um, because you've been taught, right, that Confederates are can be good, but the clan isn't, right? That you can make a distinction between these two things. And then later, make sure I'm getting all my notes right here. What's that picture? This photograph. Dad took this photograph. Yeah. yeah. About at the event. So, 
So a lot of that just runs through like uh, like the, the 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 way that it shows up in in the place, the way that the the history that I'm talking about shows up in the places that it's not doesn't show. There's a lot of silence about it, right? Um, so for me, like I grew up before I could read, I was I was reading, I was looking at picture at pictorial histories of the Civil Civil War, which I thought was the Silver War because the the pictures were black and white, right? And so I would just see these uh, pictures of like a lot of devastation, right? And and I also knew that I had a name after him, and I was like, am I going to have to do that? You know? And that just sucked to think about, you know? Um, so I just I think I just like I said, it's a very rural place, definitely a place where like the uh, Christian nationalism has like took a firm hold after Vietnam, if not before that, right? Um, uh, and in a very poor place, there's there's no uh, higher education in the county, right? There are neighboring counties, people can go, but people go and they don't come back, you know? Um, so I just projected this story that I had about the Civil War on everything. And when I saw how much it sucked around me, it was a beautiful place. When I saw like poverty and, and segregation, like this like total non-contact of, of people who were different from each other, um, I just attributed that to the Civil War. So you can uh, I'm not going to talk about this for super, super long, but I do want to say uh, I didn't know when this happened in 1997. Uh, I did not know that in 1979, in an hour away, uh, five people had been killed and 10 wounded uh, activists had been killed and wounded at a death to the Klan rally in Greensboro, um, which uh, is like it's an hour away. Uh, this is this is. Um, and I show this because I mean, I'm aware of where we are right now, you know, and uh, I don't want to speak of, uh, too closely to to what happened on uh, August 12th, but like, because I wasn't there, but I was intentionally like not there. We had a, a not quite year old child yet, and, and and we had been part of this uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Greensboro 25 years after this to try and like get the city to acknowledge that it had a role in, in the fact that um, these five people were killed in 10 years. If you want to learn more about that, I could just have to point you in more, in more directions. But the, but, the, but the point of this being that like, the way that we have reached the quote equilibrium with the white nationalist movement in the, in the South, especially as white people, it's just to let like let sleeping dogs fly, right? Which is a which is like a really dangerous thing to do, but also the alternative, one of the alternatives. And but but for whom? So I'm going back to this. So after this event, my church and some other local community members had a, a, a cleansing ceremony. On the steps, which we felt very proud of ourselves. And it's good. I'm not saying it should have been done, but it's just like who was the cleansing for? Right. Um, and there was certainly wasn't a lot of other um that I I didn't know I was 16 years. Um uh, activism going on to, to 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 try and provide a counter narrative, right? Um yes. My dad's in the bottom here. Um, my mom's here. Is my little brother's or Astrid's time. Um, she's a lesbian. He's a, he and her were like total organic farmers who, who had, ran a no electricity farm. Um, these two were high. So I don't know, we had our own, that was our own little like, you know, multicultural. Uh, democracy in Stokes County in 1997. So, thinking about rituals of absolution, rituals of cleansing, right, and shame, right. Um, yeah. 
who's the cleansing board, who's the absolution board, and you know who's um, is it mourning, is it shame, is there a difference? Doesn't matter. Uh, I've always found the link between these two images really powerful. This is the Robert E. Monument in Richmond being dedicated in 1890, and you can't see it in this picture, but his but his head is his head is covered in a hood as well. So it's it's just the, the kind of like brackets of tarping on this on these objects. The painting behind this is the painting that's taken from. It's called a maternal caress. It's by Mary Casada. So back to like the hoarding and the keeping of objects in England. So this is this is a portion of the stack of magazines. This is look the photograph. It's funny because it was taken as like a three D scan uh, at a time when, it, which is actually how those prints back there were made. When you take a three D scan of an object, um, it produces what's called a texture map. Which after it reads all the like ins and outs and voids of the object, uh, and then you can then reapply the texture map on it. But for some reason, it means it's been broken up in a in order to do so. This is that first image again. And I think, you know, I can do another talk about the role of technology in all this because the fact is I would have been able to like look at it still, right? But once you can, once you have information, it's kind of hard to like not use it. Um, so that image, this book, another book that's been does important to me, um, this is about attachment um, and uh, about how babies are born come into the world with all their senses and with like systems of integrating information around them and of coordinating information around them. Like say they can they can learn that if water is running, they see the water running and they hear the water running, they know that they can understand that the water, that the sound is coming from the water, right? We're, we're that we have that installed, right? And then if you feel the water, hear the water, see the water, then you can integrate this whole idea of like what running water is, right? But they have to have an attachment figure to help them do that. Um, this is also by Mary Cassatt. I just like that image, um, like the baby just trying to like smash its face. I'm like, I want to go back in, you know. Um, there. And and this image was very purposely chosen by Daniel Stern for this for this book because you can see. The baby's holding the mother's face and the mother's holding the baby's foot, right? So there's this the feedback loop and then the eyes connecting, right? But this fits into her kind of like uh, historical kind of like um, kind of uh, image of within our history, within popular history as being like this painter of like seminal scenes between children. But I like this scene because uh, there's a lot more, it's a lot more realistic. This is that Principia, which is why it's flipped, it flipped there. Um, it's a little bigger than that. Um, uh, the, the, the baby's grabbing the caretaker's face, and the caretaker is uncomfortable, right? The caretaker is trying to, gripping the baby and trying to pull the baby's hand away. Oh, also, the reason I included this is like that image on the right there is 1891. So that was like a year after this was dedicated, you know. So I just like thinking about diachronic time and synchronicity, things happening across and what's going on in different places. And this is kind of being used by Japanese woodblock prints, which were very in fashion in the late 19th century when uh, those who were in vogue. And, Major metropolitan areas in Europe and America. Okay, so if we look at this as an essential, like as a dyad, as a self and other kind of relationship, we can, uh, if we can think, we can, it can open up a, a larger conversation about what the material is. 
So if you have a child, right, you, you're on the left, your child is on the right. Right? You're trying to keep that from just showing your face. And all they're trying to do, they're doing their job, which is to figure out what, what the hell is this, right? And using all their means of doing that. But you can also look at it as your parent and you, right? Or your caregiver and you. What, what you did necessarily had to do to them. We can also look at it as the parent is the, is the past and the child is the present, trying to heal the past and understand what it, what it is. Um, but Walter Benjamin says that the past and present is too, is too um, stuck in time. Like if we think about it instead of, because that's temporal, but we can think about the, the, what has been versus the now, and we can think about time more expansively than just like the past. Because what's past changes every second, but the what has been is not. And any self other relationship, any, for almost any of these, you can flip the you can flip the the terminology. This is, but this is where it really. This is why I started using this material in this way, based on this book right here. Was what if we took this idea about attachment and and then put it, projected that onto. Um, place on where you're from, right? From like your family of origin or or the landscape where you're from, right? The, the thing that produces you. implications of, of these images either, especially amongst the, the theologians and <laughs> artists of the 16th century Renaissance. And that's it. Sorry, that's a picture of my dog. I haven't forgot how to use one yet. So that's, that's, the end. that's the end. You have to use one. The plot on the news. Wow. Yes. Okay. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. You guys have a question? How how well do you talk to your kids about where you're from, or how do you talk to your kids about where you're from? I know, <laughs> I know your kids. <laughs> I can talk to those people. <laughs> um, they love it. They love it. I mean, they don't know. I mean, where I'm from is America, you know. Right. So when when <clears throat> when Trump was elected, I just said it starts coming with passion um, because it's the same kind of politics of just kind of like very aggressive, say white or out loud um, thing. So that, that and that felt really scary because I, I was like, I I I can't escape from anywhere everywhere is that. Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, a privilege to be able to anyway. Um, but, uh, so I have not figured out how to talk about America yet, but they love going to Danbury um, because they get to see their cousins and because my parents have these giant rocks that grow out of their yard that they can then grow out of their yard, like they're on the property, um, that they can climb on and the house is full of the old age stuff, you know? Um, they don't have the baggage about it, thank God. That I have, you know, they're not like, I'm going to have to deal with all this, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, how will I talk to them about it? Um, Eula Biss wrote an essay um, in New York Times called White Debt that was about having a conversation with her four year old son about, about um, like the Mayflower and uh, about um, settlers. And um, and their wife, um, their kid's wife, and her trying to explain the Pilgrims and the, and the Indians to, to the kid, and the kid being like, "So we're from the bad city," and she's like, "If you want to put that way, yes." And then they just started crying. He was like, "I don't want to get that city, right?" Which is like, we talk about disavowal and 
avoidance of grief, you know, especially for like for white people, like uh you didn't ask for someone to do like um decades and decades and centuries of like uh, systemic violence in your name when you were born, right? But that and then, then it becomes this cost of like never learning about it, right? Just trying to run from it so that you just don't ever have to actually do it. And so there's I think that you know, sort of too. So I've got to change my mm -hmm. But they could be on a good team. You don't have to be stuck on the best group, you know. Um, I think this is one one question I think you can answer quickly and then and then maybe a second longer where well, you put me up for a challenge. Mm -hmm. First, do you read the, the famous Thomas painting as a parallel to that? Um, attachment painting, and like, is Jesus putting Thomas's hand to the wound, or is Jesus doing what the caretaker is doing and trying to almost protect it by pulling the hand away? Yeah, so I didn't walk trying to figure out what the next image is, right? It's a steal, right? It's easier if you don't have to come with the drone, right? Or just steal, right? Tori, <laughs> right? You know, if you can just steal from somebody else, it's better, right? Um, and I actually think that this is a good candidate, right? Because it's still got the self other dynamics in it, you know? Um, uh, I mean, I always read it as him putting it in there, right? Yeah. But look at his, I mean, you can't really see it on here. His face, it's gross. The expression on Christ's face when he's making it is definitely like the ecstatic, like pleasure pain, like, right. like, like look at how real my wound is, you know? Um, so I, um, I think he's got it. So it's, it's it's reverse of this in that way. Uh, yeah, kind of, yeah, for sure. And if you decide to work with this image, you're gonna it's, it's gonna be time to deal with sex in your work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And I can I think there's actually a lot of good reasons. Queer, queer devotion towards both what female mystics refer to as the split. Oh god, is uh, medieval mystical writing. Oh. Um okay, the other more substantive question from your work, your earlier work, the collages, I was thinking about how you think about beauty in what you're making mm -hmm. with these things and it was especially the one before this that just I the the first thing I saw was beauty here, and then I can like slowly start reading the image where I start feeling weird about being yes. struck by beauty as soon as I saw it, and it's so that's how I was sitting here thinking about that, and then when you got to the bouquet, okay, right? Or I don't know if you want to call it that, but you were you talked about the decaying beauty. Um, right. So I just was wondering how you think about when when you're when you're engaging with memory and memory of violence and then producing objects that could be read as beautiful. How, how do you think so about that? Yeah. Well, um, that's a very subtle question. Yeah, thank you. Um, my parents are musicians. Uh, we grew up in a very musical household. We're music teachers. And I never felt conflicted about appreciating musical beauty, right? Now, as an older person, you know, I can listen to like Bachman and be like, oh, you know, this is problematic, knowing who he was, uh, which I don't know very much about, but I think that he was like beloved by Hitler, the third right? So, um, mm -hmm. But I can also, Listen to like Kestrati singing, you know, in like super high pitches because they literally never been in having puberty or something like that. You know, and just like, wow, this is really beautiful and messed up at the same time, right? So I, I do think that there's a sense of like, like what is art for? Well, I mean, we, we want to see, we want to kind of like break time a little bit and just like have like an engagement with something that is that. Feels like where you're taking out of like 
the complexity of all and messiness of every day, right? Um, uh, but it's also yeah, to, like to be make to try to make things that are beautiful when you're like I think appreciating beauty as like a and like privileging that when you're also trying to like regulate like your own your own uh, social location and, and privilege is like a broad kind of um, yeah, I think it's just trying to describe that. Um, yeah, because you're not sure the beauty you're recognizing is really seen in the past and who goes to the past. Is that good? <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Matt, I've got a, a question. Uh, <clears throat> you were showing a slide of like your dad's like uh, wardrobe or like this like uh, chest of drawers or something. It's got yeah. shit on it. And uh, no, no, know, that's in the living room, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, the second living room. I uh, I grew up in a really similar kind of area, right? Like, yeah. Really, really poor, really, really isolated in Kentucky, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I've always found this stuff like the Americana and just like the collecting and, and like the privy digging. You know, mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of similar kind of experiences growing up that are really formative for me. And some of them were kind of fucked up. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've, I've always thought about like totems and about like, uh, you know, kind of not maybe not artifacts, but like things that are haunted. Right. Mm -hmm. And you said something that I wrote down that I thought was really cool. We were, we were talking about like, redeeming objects because mm -hmm. i feel like and a lot of times like in what i try to do with things that i'm maybe i um, i just think that was a really interesting way to think about uh your past you know yeah. and then, like your origin and kind of like uh the setting right right uh, and you kind of like vibrating off of the setting um, yes uh, yes definitely vibrating off the setting maybe all of my like this is all my mom my dad did not He's messy, but he would not live like this because it's just, just him. Like, like, like one of my favorite things that she does, one of my favorite, my, my favorite art moves of my mom is that she tucks pictures inside the front of the frame. Yeah, everywhere. Right. Because that's, that's a good frame. You know, yeah, yeah. Whole picture, you know. So um uh there's this kind of like yeah, ad hoc way of, of, of community. So when you're talking about what you say resonating, you said you know, what did you say? Resonating something off, off of that. Like, yeah, 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 definitely like. Growing up in this like very tactile household, um, my dad was always making things. My mom was always stacking things, <laughs> keeping things, <laughs> arranging things. And it's always different. It's always different. The installation is on. It's a real vivid history. So, um, <clears throat> and uh, so, but I, but I, but I do think that, like. Like at the question that I asked at at my um, opening and the question that, that Marisa and I have recent weeks and I have talked about a little bit that, that um has really been kind of like a tough question that to answer and to, and to even wrestle with is well there's two of them. One is like if we if we know that our that our bodies are politicized vessels of history of power and conquest, regardless of our awareness or intentions. Is there such a thing as individual transformation for me, for an object, right? Like, does that matter at all, right? Or is that just like a privileged game to play, right? Um, oh, I feel so bad about this, you know, like the blah, 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 right? And then, and then the other one, the, the other question is like, is, uh, yeah, at what point is navel gazing? What's navel gazing? What, what point did navel gazing become a form of violence? You know, where it's just like we we'll talk about it a lot, but not do it. You know, what's art's relationship to that? You know, at the same time, you know, uh, I don't know. I I don't know why. I like my dad. My dad said, "Do you want this stack of magazines? You may work out the Civil War." And I said, I don't know. 
right? So it's like at the same time I took it on, and then I was like, let me, and then it kind of got stuck in, right? Like, like how what to do with this, what to do with this, what to do with this, and I couldn't like put that down, right? Um, so I had this impulse that it's does feel effectively harmful. So you know, let me just transform these to see what happens, right? Yeah. On like a granular level. Like I think of it as still a wash, you mm -hmm. know, but it's like not atomic or the like it was a very grainy little collage, right? They're just cut up and put back together again in this small time And at that time I was thinking a lot about because it was my grandparents moving into this living facility, I was thinking a lot about death and and uh, yeah, what's left and everything just um, materiality, identity, how our spirit passes through our organs in a weird way. It's like something that I've been thinking a lot about recently. I lost my grandfather like a few months ago, and he was also just a collector of just like whatever, mm -hmm. you know, just like walking like sheds and shit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I always thought they were like total like installations. Yes. You know, yes. It's like you walk into your grandpa's house, you're like, this is yeah. fire. <laughs> this is fire. <laughs> you know, only the UBA people can see this. <laughs> Uh, so I'm just, you know, I, and I appropriated my entire grandfather's house. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, yeah, I just thought it was really interesting the way that you're talking about like a redeeming, or maybe not a redeeming, but like, like maybe like the immorality of that, or like the immorality of transforming something. Yeah. Uh, which is something that I think we all kind of yeah grapple with. When I was in grad school, when I was doing that book up, I had a, a friend of mine who was in in, in, in the program. Jewish and Jewish color. Are you sure you want to be just buying books? You know? And I was like, I don't know, I really haven't just this book making around for a while. I'm not going to I'm not I'm not pulling in the like tractor to like steamroll a pile of you know Casey Chick CDs right now or anything like that. You know, I just like this one, you know, that is important to me. And that's something like the, the like the the love of critique, right? The critique is love, you know, feels is is really important to remember it's like if, if i claim this I, I deserve i have earned the ability to, to tell it why i think it's wrong i'm thinking about the word digestion and yes. that like can an can an object or a person be transformed and there's this whole like christian theological reading of individual transformation that has this other set of valences, but also an object can be transformed by being digested. Yes. And it, when something's digested, is it destroyed? Like, do you want to destroy these books? Is a is is a, making a claim about what happens to these books? Yes. I am feeling like these books are being digested. Yes. Right. Which is a different kind of transformation. Yeah. So totally. that's and that's that's a, a, a great way. Of, you know, never thought about that. So like, definitely thought about food a lot. Because, <laughs> you know, you go, yeah, it's weird it on the walls there. You know. Um, uh, but yeah, the idea of, of digestion, of making it into something that's essentially compostable, you know, and all this is reusable. Like, I can, I'll scrape that off the wall and get the exhibition of yoga use it again, you know. Um, so, but yeah, I, I think that that's a, a more, um, yeah, when I was thinking about. When I started making the, these images, I was thinking a lot about transformation. Um, we often think about transformation as being like this positive thing, right? But some, but some forms of transformation might be more like decomposition, right? Which may not be yeah. <laughs> which is necessary. It's just natural, you know. So. The first thing, I mean, you were talking for a long time and you did not notice that, that was that there was even a person in that image when that was me. And I was just like, that is Jason, it's Jason Mask, and I was a serial killer. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And then you like revealed that it's Lee, and it was like, oh, perfect, because I'm looking at a serial killer. Yeah. One well, in Terry pictures that are great is a great I talk about like the, the how do you how do you show time in a picture, right? How do you show time in a two-dimensional or static image? Or object and having it have a picture on it already is a great way to do that.
my mind this one too, like what it would feel like to have the insides of something of the work that you're working with be so malleable and so close to you and what that would feel like and what you're like, if you're listening to something or if it's silence, like talk about going into your next sexual piece of work, <laughs> to be inside something that much, like what is happening and like, I know you have a playlist online that you can listen to yeah. with this, but I'm curious if you listened with that while making this or if that was something that came up afterwards. So there's a music, there's a sound sound component, which is not, not exactly music, um, but it has some music in it um, that we can um, turn on if we want to. Um, and I don't do it at the same time usually. I, I did listen to it a little bit while I was installing because I was like, let me see how it feels in here with this playing. There's also Tori. Is this your idea, Playlist? <laughs> Okay. So she she asked every artist if they want to create a playlist of music. And to me, the music is is something I might be listening to while I'm making work, but a lot of times when I'm when I'm really getting into it, I'm not listening to it. And it's not really my intention. It's just kind of like um it's just it's just, it, it is consuming. Yeah, it is consuming. It's just like the like ADD thing. It's just like finally found found its home. It's like I gotta, I gotta. I got one of these bags. You know, just like, mm -hmm. and, and then, yeah, and that, that, that's the sound. That's the sound. It's <laughs> just like, and heavy machinery. Just like a drone. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. Very big backwards. Yes. The consumption. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you all for coming. But, uh, have a good holiday. Good luck with your final YouTube appearance. <laughs>